and welcome back to my channel. Um, yeah, I know. I did it again, and I'm sorry, but after this video, you guys will completely understand why it took me so long to post this video, why it just, like, time management skills is not completely on my side, and just overall, like, what the surgical clerkship, like, really entails. You guys will have a better understanding as to what is to be expected of you and why your girl has not posted in another, like, two months. But... Without further ado, let's get started. So obviously, um, new environment, cute little background. I moved, as I told you guys in my last video. Uh, I'm currently now in Latin City. Um, if you guys would like an apartment tour, let me know. We're not fully finished decorating, but um, I would love to show you guys a couple of things if you're interested, so just let me know in the comments below. And then what else has been happening? I'm in the middle of my outpatient at this point of the surgery clerkship. So the way my school breaks it down, SGU, when you do surgical clerkship, it's going to be 12 weeks. I've actually run into a couple of students from uh, New York Medical College that's in upstate, not upstate, but like Westchester area. Their clerkship is only six weeks. So that's just something to keep in mind if you want to, if you're applying to medical schools or if you're just like interested in surgery, you might want to do a program that has a 12 week um, clerkship or you might want to do a sub buy, like a sub internship in surgery so that you have more time to like really grow your skills and make an impression. So overall, we had 12 weeks and the way it's broken down is you do six weeks inpatient and six week outpatient. If you have any say in the way that it's broken down, I would 100% suggest that you do outpatient on the latter half of your 12 weeks. The reason that is, is because with outpatient, you have so much more free time. Like I'm going to explain to you a day in the life of like inpatient and then a day in the life of outpatient. And the time of day that you spend in the actual hospital is completely different. Like, so I'm going to insert a quick little clip of um, my overnight call um, during inpatient. And so the way it, uh, I'll explain everything in the video, but um, here's a quick little excerpt from um, my overnight call. So I'm starting my call as day shift for the next 12 hours. Uh, I came in around 6 p.m. and then get to leave after morning rounds, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. So right now I'm gonna go get patient outputs for the night and then I'll uh, we'll do that again at 4 a.m. So I have to make sure that I get outputs before the nurses leave at 7 p.m. Sorry about the elevator noise. Um, so before the nurses leave at 7 p.m. and then again before they come in, um, well, the next just comes in at 6 a.m. Um, after that, the residents didn't really need me, so I'm here just studying for a little bit while I am waiting for um, a text from them to see if they need anything. If not, I'm kind of just going to hang out here and study, maybe take a nap, and in the morning I'm going to go get the outputs for the patients from overnight, and I'm going to also update our consensus sheet with all of the patient information and the vital signs from overnight so that we can be prepared for morning rounds. Um, since I'm here early, I might do a presentation on one of our patients. Good morning. So I am just now waking up and I am heading back down to the residence lounge. I did the patient's vital signs for the last 24 hours and now I need to get the morning output and I need to also check in and make sure that they, need, that they need, don't need anything from me. Okay, so that's basically how an overnight call works. I think I explained everything very well in the video. So typically a day for inpatient, um, you start rounds at 6 a.m. So if you want to present a patient and kind of make an impression, you want to come in around 5.15, 5.30 so that you can get some background on the patient, any significant overnight events, and you want to be able to um, present them during rounds. Rounds take about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how many patients we have. So um, around seven o'clock is when you kind of go like um, disperse, get breakfast, whatever the case may be. And then most surgeries start at 7.30. Um, when you go into the surgeries, what basically happens is you go into the OR, you have to put on the full scrub, cute uh, cute little thingies. Um, in the thumbnail, you'll see me wearing like these paper scrubs and um, scrub caps. So you have to make sure that you wear those things when you go into the OR. In there, usually the patients are brought into that area. And then you go introduce yourself to the patient and you're just like, hi, my name is Olivia. I'm a third year medical student here. I was going through this hospital and I would love to observe the surgery if it's okay with you. You always want to get consent from the patient because, you know, this is a really intimate time. They're going to be naked on the table. You're going to be seeing all of their parts and stuff like that, like their insides and stuff. And it's like, if they don't consent to it, then it's really awkward for them when you're just standing awkwardly in the room. So just like connect with the patient. And honestly, like that's one of the things that I've really super enjoyed about um, being in the clerkship now is that like at SGU, you get standardized patients. So like some of them are just like very bland. You finally get to 
speak and like have conversations with real people you know and they're like very appreciative of like these little things that we do that we take for granted and we just kind of say to get point the basic sciences whereas now in the clerkship and clinical years like those little things make a world of a difference so after you ask the patient for consent then you're going to also ask the resident and or the attending most of the times the attendings just care if you ask the residents because the residents are going to be leading the surgery for the most part and the attendings are just there to kind of watch and make sure that everything is happening accordingly and if any complications occur they're there to oversee everything but for the most part you interact with um, residents more as far as rounding goes um the surgeries and like just day-to-day -day actions you're with the residents more um as far as letter of, letters of recommendation go that is not such a bad thing at this hospital because the attendings will most likely ask the residents about you so that they can write a letter of recommendation if they feel like comfortable doing so. So don't have to worry, you don't have to worry about not being able to interact with the attendings as much. It's good to still make an impression with the residents so that in case they want to give you a letter of recommendation like the attendings, they can have like glowing, you know, remarks from the resident. Just be aware of that that, you know, you don't you want to make a good impression with the residents and the attendings, not just the attendings. I really enjoyed inpatient time just because um, being in the actual OR is just really exciting for me. It was new to me, so it was just like a really exciting experience. I had a little bit of struggle like getting my hands in the gloves. You know how like when they like they open the gloves for you and just scoop your hands in and like you know you have to stand like this. I was having the most trouble like to a point where one of the OR techs literally was like, "You're holding me up," and like I was just so scared of holding them up ever again. So like I would have all of my gloves like messed up, like fingers all out of sorts, and I would just like hide it so that they wouldn't see me fixing it while they turn around and give me like a double glove because you have to double glove. So like I would just try to hide the fact that I'm like struggling to put on my gloves so that they wouldn't like feel like I'm holding them up. And like I always thought that it was just me by myself, but I'd always talk to my friends about it. And they'll be like, me too, me too. Like I'd always struggle and I'm always scared to like mess up or like scared to ruin anything. But it's honestly like only some or our techs that are like mean about it. Others are just like take your time, you know, thumb first and then kind of scoop your hand through. And that's like the best way to get the gloves on. Um, and then once you're gloved up and you like washed your hands and all that stuff, you kind of just stand in the OR like this because you have to remember that like, your sterility is like from shoulders to about your waist length. So you have to just stand like this until they're ready to do the surgery and then you can place your hands in like the sterile environment. So you can't turn your back to the patient because you're not sterile. You can't put your hands down at your side because of course like below your waist is not sterile. Um, you can't touch your face um, once you are sterile because obviously your face isn't sterile. You shouldn't go too close to the patient. There's like so many rules that you have to learn and it's really a learning curve because it's like once you start, you don't know all these things. So it's like you have to even forget about little things that you instinctively do. For example, if an instrument is falling, you have to let it fall because it's like if you if you can grab it while it's still in the sterile field, then absolutely grab it. But like if it's like leaving the sterile field or it's like you're going to compromise your own sterility to get it leave it you know and it's like so weird to think of that because like if you see like a fork drop and you try to go catch it but it's like if like a scalpel or whatever it is is falling like you need to like let it fall to the ground while you're waiting for your surgery is like a good time to be studying i mean some people study other people took naps because it's very important to you know recuperate from your sleep because you'd be tired like don't come for me i tried my best at the time um no but seriously i slept i slept a lot um on my breaks um you know you actually have to look forward to either the first surgery or the last surgery just so that you know what i'm saying you have a good chunk of time where you can rest peacefully knowing that no one's looking for you you know yeah so in between surgeries you're kind of just hanging out in the student library you can be studying sleeping um or just doing whatever you know shopping on fashion nova don't judge me you know it was my free time i can do it with it was i please um so for some people they were actually very effective at studying and inpatient just for me it just wasn't happening like i would always just like sit down and prepare to be productive and then just go into a deep deep slumber so outpatient was really when i like finally started to like pick up and really study and do my practice questions and do U world so you know if you want to be able to space everything out evenly along the 12 weeks i would highly suggest to study in between surgeries um and things like that but if you're like me and you wait until outpatient it's also fine because um the way that sgu does it is and this is only for like this is, i can only speak to what what i know and what i have as information right now so for us right now, um, I think a 60 to a 68 is about a B. So a 60 to 68% on the NBME shelf exam, that's about a B. 
and then 70 and above is like an A and then I think like a 75 or something like that or above that is like an A plus and you like honored your shelf exam. So it's not to say that you should be lax or anything like that, but it's definitely a way different grading scale than you used to during your basic science years where a 68 is normally like a D plus or like, you know, a low C or something like that. So, you know, that also kind of gives you some perspective as far as when you're going to study, if you're going to do inpatient or outpatient, you definitely do learn a lot in the hospital. And especially like at Wyckoff, they have lectures every Thursday. So we have protected time every Thursday from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m where we have lectures and the lectures we're talking about everything from electrolyte imbalances to fluid resuscitation to anemia like anything that you need to know how to fix and address in the hospital we'll talk about that um attendings um residents and students are all present uh, and we all just have like a common discussion where they explain things to us and you feel you're, you're free to ask questions people don't be asking questions because the attendings are there and they're kind of scared. Our last lecture is usually with um, one general surgeon attending. And so he kind of just takes us through our cases from the week. So if anyone has a case they want to share, something interesting, um, then they're able to do that there. And then we kind of discuss everything, break it down as far as how did the patient present, what was given, and like as much as you know about the um, clinical course, and especially if he's the attending on the case, he'll kind of help fill in those blanks so that it's more of a common discussion. So that one's really helpful and I really enjoy that. And it's a way more relaxed setting because it's just one attending and only students, no residents. So it's a really good opportunity for us to like pick his brain, ask him questions, and he's just very into, you know, helping us and things like that. So I'm gonna tell you guys a little story. I um, decided to present a case one day, right? So I get to the hospital, I found this case, and it's a patient that has common bile duct cancer. So it was found on imaging that he has this cancer of the common bile duct. And typically, I think it's the, if it's in the distal common bile duct, it needs to be resected by a whipple procedure. And that's basically where you take out part of the pancreas, part of the duodenum, part of the stomach, and you take out the entire gallbladder and like the um, the cystic duct. And that's like an amazingly like, in, like it's a very invasive surgery, but it's just an amazing like overall surgery to just watch, be a part of. And after I presented that patient, he needed a whipple. So they assigned me to the whipple and I was like over the freaking moon. Like I was so excited. Um, most of the procedures that we do at the hospital that I work at, um, it's mostly laparoscopic. So for the most part, I've actually never personally seen an open procedure. So this is gonna be my first one. I like sat up all night doing research and watching YouTube videos and like learning the anatomy. So if, if in case I was get, I would get pimped out, I would know exactly what to, to say, what to do, what quite a questions to ask. And it was just super exciting. Um, unfortunately, the patient did have metastasis to the liver. That means is we could no longer do the whipple, the whipple la, 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 la. why can I say that word? We could no longer do the whipple procedure and that's because um, once there's metastasis, the procedure is no longer beneficial to the patient because there's cancer other places. And so um, it was unfortunate on both ends, honestly, um, us because it would be a really interesting procedure to watch and just be a part of, but more so for him because at this point we were no longer able to provide any kind of intervention and we kind of just have to close him up and, you know, give him his prognosis, you know. Um, Thankfully, we didn't do a full open procedure. What you begin with for that would be a diagnostic laparoscopy. So you just go in um, through little portholes in the stomach, and that way you can check to see if there's any type of lesions or um, anything anywhere else. And so when we went in, we did find lesions on the liver. We sent it to pathology, and then it came back as a dental carcinoma. So we had to close them up, and it was just smaller holes. But um, it was just a really interesting case to see, and it was also just it was just eye opening, you know, for like us, for the patient. It was just like these things really happen so by the end of the day around 4 p.m that's when you can officially check out for the day or like sign out for the day so you've checked in around 5 36 a.m and now you're leaving around 4 p.m and then every time i would come home i would just have dinner and pass out and just fall asleep so that's why like inpatient it just wasn't a good time for me to study personally but in outpatient my days can be as short as like 9 to 12 9, 9 to 1 um, it's really super different than inpatient. So you just get to go home and like really be productive and study. 
So for me personally, the absolute best part of the surgical rotation for me so far has definitely been outpatient. Um, I do think that you do a little bit more as far as engaging with the learning process and inpatient being active in the surgery. However, I think that outpatient is actually the time when you get to really like kind of hone in on your skills and like really try to figure out what kind of doctor that you want to be. Um, I say this because you get to go to clinics, right? And we are specialized in different areas um, at the hospital that I work at. So there's hand clinic, there's plastic clinic, there is wound care clinic, um, bariatric clinic. So you get to have a specialty or focus on one thing specifically for that day. In some clinics, more than others, they allow you to do a lot more. So for example, when I was in ortho clinic, they literally were just like, when you're ready, go into the room, get the history, do a physical, and then go present that information to the attending. And so I was really just kind of thrown in there and just trying to figure out what to do. The attending that I was working with was actually super, um, I'm not gonna say he was super nice because he wasn't super nice at all, actually. He was a little bit mean, but like in a tough love situation where he was kind of just like, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want it done. And you know, don't really apologize. Cause like I'm the kind of person that just uh, like instinctively always says, sorry, 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 sorry. And like, he was literally like, no, you're not, no, you're not. And I was like kind of freaking out at first. And like, I got angry in the beginning of the day. Cause I was just like, why is such being like such an a-hole? Like why is being so mean? But like, he's not, you know what I mean? Like this is his clinic, these are his patients and he expects a certain caliber of work. And so, you know, he's kind of just expecting the students to fall in line and by the end of the day, I honestly was really grateful for the experience and I was grateful for the tough loves kind of situation because you don't need someone that's going to be super nice and kind of just let you watch and just explain things to you. You want someone that's going to throw you in there and, you know what I'm saying, force you to swim in a sense. So in ortho clinic, I really had a good time with that because I was able to take a full history and put the information in the soap note and put in the physical exam and do a physical exam myself, you know, and try to even come up with some di diagnoses or like kind of next steps for the patient. And I present it to the attending and he kind of tell me, fix this, add this, um, you know, come and watch me do a physical exam so you know what I'm expecting. He was hard in that sense, but I honestly took a lot away and a lot of information away from that clinic. Um, in other clinics, like ophthalmology clinic, the sole job is really just turn the lights on and off. Um, not very exciting, but I will say that it's very vastly different. Um, in hand clinic, I had a really good time where I was able to undress and dress people's um, dressing like on their hands. Um, same thing in wound clinic. But um, the only thing I will say is that I definitely had to make my schedule intense. So like I've been doing like straight 30 questions a day, 40 questions a day, that kind of thing. Um, I've also been using online med ed and I've been finding that extremely helpful. I just really enjoy his videos and like following along with the um, worksheets and just kind of taking notes on that. That has been super helpful and he's very direct and to the point as far as um, this is what it is, this is how it presents, diagnosis, testing, and that's literally how the questions are asked on UWorld. So it's super helpful to be able to do that. Um, another great resource is Dr. Pastana's. Uh, it's like this little notebook. I got it off of Amazon. Um, also a great resource because it's direct right to the point. So if, if I had to give any advice going into it, heavy in GI, heavy in trauma, definitely know those back and forth. It was definitely a hard rotation, I will say, even though I'm not finished. It has been a really difficult rotation, but I'm just really happy to get something that's so hard and so time consuming out of the way early on so that the next couple of rotations will be a little more easy. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to keep my eyes open and see what other specialties are out there. Um, my heart's an EM in emergency medicine, but, you know, since this is my first rotation and I was kind of intrigued by surgery and like long term care of patients, I'm actually kind of excited to see if, you know, my head will turn um, if I go to another another specialty. So I've got to see um, if you guys watch Love Island. You know what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm really excited to just like get my head out there and just see what's out there and see what I fall in love with. So we will I think I've pretty much touched on everything that I want to talk about today. Just like inpatient scheduling, outpatient scheduling, how to manage your time with um, studying, how to be better than me and not sleep while you're an inpatient. Even if you do sleep, I won't judge you. You know what I'm saying? I did it, so I'm not gonna judge you. If you guys have any questions about surgery clerkship, if you have any questions about the subject exam, I'll be taking mine August 12th. So anytime after that, if you guys want to message me on Instagram, if you want to leave a comment below about asking um, what to expect and like what things I studied for, what did I see on the exam, then I will be more than happy to answer those questions. And if you guys have questions about anything else, please feel free to leave comments below. Um, DM me on Instagram. I've actually really enjoyed having people DM me on Instagram because I just feel like 
you guys are actually watching my videos and you guys are actually, you know what I'm saying, like reaching out and I just love that 100% and I would love to help in any way I can. The more information that you have, the better choices you can make and the less mistakes you can make and that's what I am here for is to just kind of tell you about my experience so that you can make better choices or you can use my information to make the best choice for you and I appreciate and love the love that I've been getting on my videos. Um, I love the outreach that people have been um, giving me in my DMs and please continue to do so. Um, all of my information will be linked down in the description bar as far as how to contact me and for your Instagram. Um, and then again, you can also leave comments in the comments section down below. I hope you guys really enjoyed this one and I know that I've been away for a while, but I will be better. And don't forget that if you want to see a um, apartment tour, please let me know in the comments below and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!